good afternoon good evening as the place you are in welcome to apom school webinar 2022 and this is the fourth webinar in 2022 we started the apom school webinar in june 2021 we hold seven webinars in 2021 and this is the fourth webinar at home school in 2022 making it 11th webinar all together and this is in addition to monthly at home webinars we are conducting thanks to dr michael lee whom i requested to organize one at home school webinar and he happily arranged this at home school webinar on radio therapy advanced technique and three eminent speaker will be speaking about the different aspects and the advances in radio therapy technology first will be by dr matthew chung and he will be speaking on mr linear commissioning qa and clinical applications new uh, technology almost uh, two years back it has come and started functioning and an opportunity to visit mr linac facility in hong kong second talk will be from dr nelson fung and he will be talking on single isocenter multi lesion stereotactic radio surgery and radio therapy and third talk will be from professor jing kai and he will be talking on artificial intelligence in radio therapy and at the end we will take question so please put your questions during the talk or in the chat box all the questions will be collected and the discussion will be held by a uh, moderator will take all the question michael lee put to the speakers and we'll get discussions Uh, Dr. Matthew Chung is a principal physicist, medical physics division at Chinese University Hong Kong Medical Center. Elaborately, Michael Lee will introduce him. Dr. Nelson Fung is a certified medical physics, medical physics department at Pamela Yunde, uh, Nether Seoul Eastern Hospital, which I visited. Uh, Michael Lee was kind enough to uh, take me around. Professor Jing Kai is a professor and director of medical physics, chair of postgraduate scheme. in health technology the hong kong polytechnic university i will just introduce shortly uh, today's moderator dr michael lee he is head of the medical physics pamela yonde nether soul eastern hospital and he is president of the hong kong association of medical physics and i am associated with him with him last many years he is contributing hugely to the apom activities without taking without taking not more time i hand over the floor to michael lee to introduce the first speaker and start the webinar before that i request all the participant to mute yourself and put off your cameras off so that you get a good good bandwidth so michael lee now the floor is yours Thank you, Aaron. I'm just starting to show my screen. Okay. So, hello, everyone. So, we've got uh, three speakers from Hong Kong today, and uh, as you've heard, they will talk about different aspects of some interesting radiotherapy technology. And our first speaker is Dr. Matthew Jo. Dr. Matthew Jia obtained his PhD from the University of Hong Kong and is currently the principal physicist at the Chinese University Medical Center. He is also the review editor for the journals Frontiers in Neuroscience and Frontiers in Neurology. Dr. Jia is a certified radiotherapy physicist in Hong Kong. He is also certified by the American Board of Science in Nuclear Medicine as well as American Board of Medical Physics in MRI Physics. He served at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong before joining the newly established Chinese University Medical Center in 2019. He was involved in setting up the radiotherapy, uh, radiology and oncology departments 
and participated in the commissioning of the diagnostic and therapeutic machines there, including an elector MRLinux. And he's heavily involved in the development of the ML application, MRLinux application at his center. And today he will talk about the commissioning, quality assurance, as well as the clinical applications of MRLinux. So uh, Dr. Jones, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. Okay. Yeah, it's visible, perfect. Okay. Yep. So thank you for the introduction. And I would like to share with you our uh, initial experience in uh, the commissioning and the clinical implementation of our um, Electra Unity machine. So our hospital is a newly established hospital uh, owned by the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, in the New Territories uh, region in uh, Hong Kong. And thanks to the generous donation of the SH Ho uh, Foundation, we have um, an SH Ho MRD Next Center in our radiotherapy department. And we have um, one Yelata Unity. So um, there are a few um, characteristics and advantages of uh, that drives us to use the uh, MR lean lag for uh, RT treatment. Uh, first of all, the uh, MRI provides, uh, the MRI is an excellent modality for the image guidance because it provides um, a superior soft tissue visualization of the tumor as well as the OAR. Another um, feature of the, the MR lean lag is that uh, they provide the online plan adaptation workflow that gives us the uh, ability to uh, change our plan when we see there are daily change in the patient's anatomy. And finally, there is a, a possibility that uh, we could do some um, MRI imaging uh, for the, uh, to do the tumor response monitoring, but this is more in the uh, research status and there are lots of uh, ongoing publications so that uh, to see how we can use those uh, MR parameters to monitor the patients and response to the radiotherapy during the course of treatment. But this is uh, more like uh, in the, in the preclinical stage in my, in my understanding. So uh, let me first uh, brief introduce what are the key features of the uh, Yeletta Unity. They have a um, static magnetic field that uh, with 1.5 Tesla. The SAD is, uh, uh, is uh, 1.4 meter. And the nominal energy is around as uh, the nominal energy is 7 MV with a uh, flattened filtered free beam. The dose output is a bit lower than the um, than other uh, Linux available. It's only 425 MU per minute. The nominal ball diameter is 70 centimeters. But uh, as you can see, the couch is here. So uh, actually, the, the, the actual volume is uh, a bit. Uh, lower. So the patients that are going to uh, receive the treatment at Unity uh, should expect that they have to uh, stay inside this, um, this uh, a bit crowded uh, environment for a while. Another thing is that the uh, field, uh, maximum field size at uh, SAD is 57.4 times 22 cm squared. That is if the patient is lying here, the superior inferior direction, the uh, maximum field size is 22 cm. So this is just a, a quick overview of the Unity hardware. The patient is uh, lying inside the ball, and then uh, immediately outside this is the MRI machine, and you can see the uh, coils are here. And this is the beam uh, beam generation components. So the primary beam would go through the MRI machine and then uh, go to uh, treat the patients. There is an MV imager. Uh, that could do the epid imaging here, but it is not for clinical use. They only use it uh, for uh, QA use. That is, um, yeah, the, the RTTs would not use this. Uh, M it's not possible to use this uh, MV imaging during the uh, clinical sessions. And the important thing is that we have the MRI that's uh, in, in the middle between the primary beam and the patient. So uh, we have to consider that there's a cryostat there. So the cryostats are mainly the helium and also the, the coils that provide the uh, superconducting uh, uh, characteristics of the uh, main magnetic field. 
So um, what should be considered? Of course, there would be beam attenuation as well as some uh, hardening of the cryo stacks. Um, in order to minimize these effects, the Philips and Eletta, they have a special design that is they split the coil into two parts, as you can see here. So the radiation, uh, the coil will not obstruct the radiation beam. Uh, however, there is still uh, some uh, a very thin layer to connect these two parts. And also for all these coils, they have to be connected to each other. So they design it in a way such that all the um, all the cables go through this uh, helium crossover pipe, so that um, the, the, there is a very high attenuation here, and there is a forbidden angle of this machine. It's around eight to eighteen uh, and uh, that degree for the gantry angle. Of course, that depends on your uh, fuel size. So there are a few um, size considerations that should be considered for the uh, ML lean neck installation. Um, first of all, there's the bunker dimension. And more, uh, most importantly, um, there, as you can see here, there is a large gantry ring sitting on the stand here. So in order to accommodate this, uh, if this is the hospital uh, level of the floor, uh, we need to duck, uh, duck a certain depth uh, more than around one meter depth uh, to accommodate this kind of uh, this uh, huge gantry ring. So this is the um, most important thing to consider when you uh, when you think about whether a, a bunker can accommodate uh, can install an elector MRD net. Also, um, the the largest part is this uh, gantry ring as well as uh, during the installation we need to. We need this uh, A-frame. So for the delivery route, uh, you really have to uh, make sure that there is enough clearance to uh, deliver these two large components. For the uh, radiation shielding, there is uh, less an issue because there is a primary beam stopper in this uh, machine. So you uh, you only have to con mainly consider the uh, patient scatter as well as the helicage. So um, our, our experience is that uh, you uh, have, if you consider to uh, uh, reserve the option of installing an ML lean lag in your bunker, yeah, you should seek the site planning guidance from the vendor as early as possible. Of course, there are other considerations that is uh, specific to the MRI of course. Uh, for example, you should uh, avoid, to avoid the sites to be chosen uh, close to some uh, largely moving from magnetic objects like the uh, escalator or the the, um, the the trains, and there is of course an RF shield by the radiation shield, and also uh, you have to consider the crunch pipe. You know, crunch pipe is not uh, high enough for a certain level, then we have this kind of um, stopper to avoid the throw spikes in case of an ML crunch. So this is our size layout. This is where the unity is. And for the ML safety, we follow the uh, ACL zoning that's defined it, uh, into four zones. So the first, uh, at first the patients uh, can freely access the zone one area here, and then they will be greeted and, and uh, the, the the nurse in the reception would also greet the patients and do the uh, MR assessment. The MR assessment has to be done daily. The patient will then be guided to go into uh, entering the maze. So we have the um, radiation door here. And then the patients would enter the song four, that is the treatment room here. And this is the door of our treatment room that is um, uh, the, just like the scan room of the diagnostic MRI that uh, you need to have all the ML safety notice um, to, to, to avoid uh, people accidentally going in. And then for the control room and for the data uh, unity, there are really a lot of systems and there are, you can see there are lots of different monitors here. First of all, of course, you need the CCTV and the linear console and there is a separate system that could uh, operates the MRI machine uh, separately. And you need the sequencer and we uh, change the monitor of the online Monaco into a, a Wacom tablet because um, as I said before, the oncologist can have an option to choose that 
uh, he or she can uh, modify the plan uh, when the patient is still on couch and she can, he or she can do the contouring. So that's why we uh, have a welcome here. And of course, you may have, uh, you may need the hospital information system. And then I will talk about uh, our experience in uh, the commissioning. First of all, I would like to talk about uh, absolute dose calibration. And currently, there is uh, no published code of practice by major standards authority about how we should do the absolute dose calibration of the MRD net. So uh, basically, we follow the uh, letters recommendation. We calibrate the dose so that uh, we could deliver 100 centigrade per 100 mu at the ISO center. And the depth is 5 cm. That is the uh, SSD will be 138.5 centimeter by 10 times 10 uh, centimeter square beam and delivered from the gantry 90 degrees. The reason that they choose, uh, they suggest that we should do it in the uh, uh, gantry 90 degrees is to avoid the output variation because of the helium level. As I mentioned before, there is a cryo that inside the um, uh, inside the MRI. So in order to avoid this kind of output variation, uh, many institutions, as well as the uh, vendor's recommendation, is that we should uh, do the absolute dose calibration at 90 degrees. And interestingly, there is also an option to calibrate this at different depths. By different depths, I mean that you can choose to uh, calibrate the dose at, uh, uh, at the depth of DMS or at the depth of 5 cm or 10 centimeters. And in this machine, they will uh, adjust the gun duty cycle to achieve this. And the easiest way, the uh, simplest way to do the, um, to cater for the magnetic field effects is that uh, usually uh, we would add uh, additional KB factor in our formalism to take into account the magnetic field effects. But this kind of uh, K factor is uh, very difficult to be measured in, uh, in, in by, by a nine chamber. So um, most of the literatures would have the Monte Carlo simulations and uh, there are some suggested values depending on the ion chamber and also the um, orientation of the, of the ion chamber. Because there, as you can imagine, the orientation of the ion chamber would have, uh, uh, um, the orientation of the ion chamber uh, would be affected by the magnetic field in a different way. And uh, right now we are positioning ion chamber uh, parallel with the magnetic field because the correction, correction factor is smaller. And the uh, value is about uh, 0 0.993 for a PTW uh, blue pharma chamber. So you can uh, see that the, the effects of the magnetic field affects approximately 0.7%. And uh, just like uh, other protocols like uh, TRS483, uh, we use the TTR 2010 to determine the uh, quality factor. And after we do the uh, absolute dose calibration, we also uh, want to do the dose audits by uh, other parties. And we know there are at least a few national or international uh, authorities that can uh, cater the dose audits for the MRD net. But uh, it's uh, important to check with these services to see if there are specific guidelines for the MRD net. For example, there will be uh, some different orientation of the OSLD may affect the results. And in um, our hospital, we uh, chose the uh, MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center service uh, to do the dose audits. So for the beam data collection, we have um, we have to acquire the data as different field size and different depths, and we make use of the PDW semiflex 3D and the micro diamond to uh, acquire the beam data. For the water tank, we use the PTW beam scan ML, and there are two base holders that are attached to the arm so that we could, uh, it could uh, travel less to acquire the entire uh, 57.4 centimeter field width. There are also an automatic water level sensor that is um, very useful because um, in the ML neck, uh, there is no uh, external laser installed. There's only a sagittal laser in the MRD net. 
And one thing that uh, we found uh, very important is that we have to be aware of the cable movement because uh, the, the, the arm has to move a lot during the um, beam scanning. So uh, then there are lots of movable parts here. So uh, before uh, putting the water tank into the ISO center, you really have to check the every movement such that the cable will not be jammed or uh, damaged. Uh, there are a few uh, special beam characteristics of the MR LINAC compared with conventional uh, LINAC. Uh, the first thing is that as there, is, uh, there will be Lorentz force acting on the electrons generated. So the cross line profile will be shifted by around uh, one to two millimeters uh, uh, in the dose distribution. Another characteristic is that there will be a shallower D mass because of the um, electron return effect that um, the, the, the shortened range of the electrons. So as, as this paper point out, you can see that the, um, with the magnetic field, uh, the, 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 the D mass would have a higher uh, value. So for the validation test, we have done uh, we have done uh, quite a lot of tests uh, with the vendor's recommendation as well as the requirements of the local authority. We have to do all these uh, safety tests and uh, and uh, special things is that we also have to do the magnetic fringe field mapping in yeah because because there's an MRI and I will talk about some of these in the in the QA part. So for this other uh, uh, for this other checks, it's actually quite similar to what we have in the, uh, the conventional LINAC. And we have also done the end-to-end uh, -end testing finally because um, we have to uh, start from scanning the uh, phantom at the CT simulator, and then we have to check whether the, the phantom under the guidance of the MRI could be positioned uh, precisely. And we, as uh, I will talk about this later, we could, uh, there are different ways of creating the adaptive plans as the uh, online TTS, the online Monaco. Uh, we then also uh, compare, we put a non chamber there and compare the TTS results with the actual measurements. And during the uh, validation, because the crowds that uh, effects would not be even along the uh, 360 degrees, therefore, uh, uh, the the uh, engineers of the uh, Yaletta and together with us has also uh, measured the crowd that's characterization transmission. That is uh, they need the uh, details about how the output is varied with different gantry angle uh, for the beam modeling. They have to do the measurements here and then put this curve into the beam modeling. So for the QA, the Daily dose output check, we use a, a quick check, a very quick a daily QA3 ML from uh, the sun nuclear. It's a quick measure of the dose output and as well as the fuel size and fuel shift. And this is actually uh, quite robust and we find it uh, reproducible. Uh, the only thing is that um, as other literature reports, the, the dose as well as the temperature and pressure detector should be calibrated around every um, uh, H2 to 10 months. And uh, in addition to what uh, have been recommended by the uh, current publications as well as uh, the uh, vendor, we also uh, developed a daily end-to-end -end workflow test. The objective is to test the connectivity as well as uh, verify the ML image scaling. The reason that we have to test the connectivity because the unity workflow involves a lot of different systems. First of all, you have to select the patient and the plan from the sequencer. And then uh, the, the, we have to use the sequencer to tell the ML machine what uh, ML imaging sequences we should use. And then afterwards, the ML images would then be sent to the TTS to do the fusion as well as the plan adaptation. And then we, uh, after we uh, provide the plan, we can also acquire some real-time MRI images to check how the motion goes in the patient. And uh, finally, after the plan is approved at the online Monaco, 
the plan will be sent back to the uh, sequencer and then the sequencer would then send the plan to the uh, inlet console for the treatment. So as you can see, there are five or six systems involved in the unit workflow. So it's actually very essential to check the connectivity of all these systems. And uh, we, we found that's uh, very useful because uh, sometimes uh, one particular system is not working and then we can figure it out um, early in the morning rather than uh, in the middle of the cases. And for the weekly dose output check, uh, we also uh, adopt a similar set. I mean, uh, we, we, we do that at gantry 90 degrees also. And we have a special uh, water uh, tank here for this purpose. Uh, this is the PTW uh, um, water phantom that is for the horizontal beam. Uh, the good thing is that uh, it has an acrylic adapter for uh, water pouring. You can pour some water and then insert the end chamber there in a reproducible way for the measurements. And we found this setup uh, quite uh, convenient and uh, time saving. Uh, it's also a good setup for measuring the uh, TPR 2010. And you may wonder why do we have to uh, pour some water into the uh, acrylic adapter? The reason is that um, there is a, a special thing about the magnetic field is that uh, uh, even with a presence of a submillimeter air gap between the ion chamber and phantom could lead to more than 1% dose uncertainty. It is because the um, the secondary electron range is shortened and it cannot um, yeah, be compensated by the, um, uh, the, the electrons at the further range. So we have to uh, really take these effects into consideration. And one simple uh, thing is that we could pour some water around the ion chamber. And these effects also affect uh, other QA tools like in the film also. And then for the weekly uh, check, uh, just like any image guidance system, we have to check, to check the coincidence of uh, the two systems, the MRI and the, and the MV radiation. So we make use of the M, uh, images acquired from the MV imager and also MRI to do the uh, registration to see if they are uh, aligned uh, in the same way as the baseline. So uh, it's an auto analysis, and then we could uh, compare the output with the uh, baseline to see if these two systems are coincided. There are also uh, automatic uh, QA tools uh, aqua from provided by uh, Elata. And this one you can uh, 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 allow the MLC and the diaphragm position to go a particular pattern and then we capture the images uh, using the MV imager. And then we could uh, check the leaf position as well as the jaw position. For the monthly radiation isocenter size, we put uh, uh, MV alignment phantom, and then we uh, this MV alignment phantom and uh, serve as two purposes. One thing is that uh, we could we try to put this uh, metal ball in the center at the isocenter so that we could do the resonance test. Another uh, purpose is that we could uh, use this uh, use this tool to calibrate the QA platform. This is a platform. Uh, designed for other QA tools. I will talk about this later. Um, the central bead is used for the resonance test and the tolerance is 0 0.5 millimeter. And uh, actually it's very stable uh, from our uh, experience of uh, around uh, for more than half a year. For the beam profile constancy, we use uh, some, uh, we use the PTW star check Messi we, the detector array has a large field size and uh, the, the, the bad thing is that it, this, this tool is really quite heavy. Um, but the, the good thing is that when we put this, uh, this detector array on the QA platform, uh, we could also measure the peripheral region of some uh, larger field sizes. For the MR image quality, we uh, use the Philips PIQT Phantom. Uh, if you have a di Philips diagnostic MRI, you will find it uh, very similar with what you have in the diagnostic MRI. And there are uh, more detailed MRI QA from, the, uh, from other uh, publications that you can make use of the ACL Phantom or uh, other Phantoms. 
And what is more in, most important in the uh, radiotherapy region is that we, uh, we want to make sure that the MRI distortion is, uh, is minimal and consistent and consistently low. So uh, we have the Philips uh, 3D geometric QA phantom is seven uh, flat plates. And there are markers in some well-defined location. Uh, actually, the, the process is very uh, automatic. And then uh, we just put the phantom on and then do the MR scanning and it will do the analysis automatically. And then they will uh, provide us with the uh, measured distortion with different uh, DSV. We also have uh, other third party uh, phantom to uh, do the MRI distortion QA. This is the uh, modus geometric distortion phantom and it provides the ability to uh, quantify whether the effects comes from the B not uh, in homogeneity or due to the gradient non-linearity. So it's, uh, this one is uh, quite uh, maybe useful if you, uh, you, have, you want to optimize your own scan sequences for the uh, like uh, MR simulation or other uh, MR uh, monitoring. So for the patient's plan specific QA one, uh, Problem is that uh, the plan is generated uh, daily adaptive in a daily adaptive way. That is, the patient is still on couch, so it's, it's impossible to do the uh, measurement uh, immediately before the treatment. So, uh, right before BMOM, right now we use the uh, other independence calculation based program that is, uh, we use the RedCal. And uh, uh, the current versions allow the input of the inline and cross line profile as well. And they have uh, demonstrated to provide a uh, reasonable accuracy if we follow the uh, APMPG 219, uh, that is uh, very likely we could uh, uh, achieve uh, all the plans within uh, the calculation within 5%. And after the treatment uh, or uh, for the, or the uh, plan specific QA for the uh, pre-treatment plan, reference plan, we could uh, do the measurement. Right now we are using the Arch ML for the uh, measurement. So uh, before I mentioned that there is a QA platform that you can uh, use the uh, ME alignment phantom to align the QA platform. And then afterwards, once you push the uh, Arch ML, you can then uh, align the phantom properly inside, uh, inside the, the board. Uh, the thing is that because you do not have the laser, so you, you, re, you need to rely on this QA platform to properly uh, align the phantom. And you can do the post treatment verification. So, uh, so far we have uh, pretty good results for the gamma passing rate. And uh, uh, most of our cases could uh, get a gamma uh, passing rate uh, larger than 95% with this kind of settings. And uh, the, the plans that are not a, Build to be achieved is are those that have the um, very small lesion that you only have a, a limited number of points measured using the Arch ML. And there are at least one uh, commercially available lock analysis software. We uh, have not uh, uh, tried this yet, but um, uh, it's possible. And I believe there are uh, some other institutions developing their own uh, code for the lock analysis. So these are our summary for the QA. So uh, right now there are more and more commercially available MR conditioning QA tools. Um, but most of them are not designed for MR imaging. You should really check it because um, during MR imaging, there could be heat induced and that may damage your QA tools. So um, you really have to read the instructions carefully. And uh, just now we mentioned that the air gap could have an effect to the measurements. So you have to be aware of the susceptibility and because of the lack of the laser, so the readiness and the reportability of how the equipment could be aligned in the uh, ML LINAC is, uh, is also important and should be considered. So the, the Electric Consortium, they, uh, they have a group of different uh, pioneering uh, institutions using the Unity. They have uh, generated reports to suggest the uh, uh, QA frequency as well as the uh, acceptance level. So it's a, it will be a good reference. And so far from the, our experience, as well as uh, other published uh, literature, we found that um, the, those um, output as well as mechanical parts of the LINAC and ML image quality are quite uh, stable. So finally, I would like to talk uh, about this quickly about uh, the clinical implementation thing. So um, this is the 
typical clinical workflow, the daily 3D MR images are acquired for plan adaptation. And then we can, we would do the image fusion of the MRI and the uh, planning CT. So if you, uh, if the oncologist or the, uh, the, the, the operators deem it um, uh, necessary to do the recontouring, it's actually possible. And then we would do the plan adaptation. And then uh, before the treatment or during the treatment, we can do some mo uh, motion management uh, images. These are some uh, real-time uh, true fit speed image uh, acquired in the three principal planes. And yeah, just like uh, you can monitor how, how the patient, how the patients, uh, whether it is stable during the treatment. And then uh, afterwards we do the plan approval, uh, calculation-based QA as well as the treatment delivery. So there are two methods for uh, online plan adaptation in this uh, machine. The first one is the, the adapt position. Basically, um, the, it's just do a rigid registration of the daily ML and the pre treatment CT. And then uh, the, the MLC and as well as the jaw will be shifted to um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. That's right, yeah. just carry on. Okay. And yeah, and then we can uh, use the CT as a, uh, for the optimization. And the reason for doing this is that uh, the couch of the uh, MRD neck cannot uh, be, um, cannot be uh, adjusted uh, freely like uh, the other uh, systems. So instead of uh, moving the patient, the, the MLC as well as the jaw could be uh, uh, adapted to the uh, rigid um, translation of the patient. Another approach is the adapt to shape, that is the ATS approach. And in this one, we, after we acquired the daily MRI, we could do the deformable registration with our uh, planning CT. And then we would deform all the structures and then you could do the uh, optimization just like how you did in the offline Monaco or how you did in a, a traditional TPS. And then you can create a, a fresh plan for this patient for this daily fraction. There are actually a few ways of, uh, uh, of, uh, of doing the optimization that provides you uh, different tools to choose from in the uh, plan adaptation. They differ, in from the, uh, they differ in the complexity as well as the time needed. So in the in the in this extreme, you could do the plan just like uh, you have an uh, MRI, and then you just do all the you just redo all the contouring, and then do all the optimization and planning just like what you did in the in the offline way. Or in the another extreme, you can just treat the patients as if, uh, if there is no uh, movement at all, and you just treat the reference plan on the patient. And and there are a uh, few options in between. So I would like to uh, share uh, some uh, two cases of uh, in our hospital that we found it um, uh, quite useful that uh, uh, by choosing the uh, MR neck. The first one is a CD bladder case. As you can see here, for the bladder, the shape could really change in uh, in daily. There could be daily variation. So for this kind of cases, uh, we did uh, quite a few uh, online and offline ATF plans. And this kind of plans can be uh, created to form a library of plans that we can uh, use in the subsequent fractions. And another application that's why right now we are uh, doing is the uh, spy mat. Um, because uh, for, for, for the SBLT spy mat, um, in the past it's, uh, it's not possible to have uh, such a clear visualization of the spinal cord. And therefore the tight margin would not be feasible. But with the MLE neck, we could uh, really have a tight margin because right now we, we could have the real time MR visualization of the spinal cord. So, um, um, for both treated sites using unity worldwide, uh, these are the prostates, liver, rectum, pancreas, and the oligomat. And as you can imagine, this kind of uh, sites are mostly the uh, abdomen regions that could uh, have some daily variation in their anatomy. And I, 
I, I don't have uh, much time to go over uh, each of these, but I would like to suggest you to uh, read some of the literatures here to see how they um, unleash the power of the, the uh, of the unity and uh, how to uh, because for each size they have some uh, unique consideration for how do they do the ATP ATS how do they uh, choose the correct uh, ML imaging sequences and as well as how do they uh, determine the margin for the um, for the motion. So to call, um, so uh, this is our discussion about the clinical implementation. And for the patient selection, you really have to uh, do the ML safety assessment before. And just look that even you have the uh, cardiac uh, implantable uh, electronic devices, it may not be necessary contraindicated, but uh, it's true that there is a, a, a lack of published literature about um, how this uh, how these patients uh, uh, should be treated in the MRE neck. And there is a tumor size limitation because our maximum field size in the superior inferior direction is only 22 cm. Uh, it may be sufficient even for uh, hand neck patients as a study by uh, the Royal Marston group. And there are special consideration for the patient's positioning and the immobilization procedures uh, because we have a small uh, ball size. And uh, the compression belts may be a uh, 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 simple and good tool because it is, is, uh, is compact in size as well as it could uh, immobilize the patients in, uh, quite well. You also have to consider the treatment duration because uh, with the ML, uh, MRO imaging as well as uh, you have to do the free diffusion and the plan uh, adaptation. Um, our experience is uh, somewhat uh, uh, consistent with the other reported literature and ATP uh, in ATP treatment lasts about uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And then an ATS treatment will last about uh, 45 to uh, one hour and 15 minutes. So uh, not every patient could uh, tolerate uh, the treatment duration that long. And also you have to uh, well prepared for the possibility that we really have to do the recontouring when the patient is still on couch uh, for the ATS treatment. So uh, you have to design a, a protocol whether the physician have to physically present. And also uh, yeah, we have to consider because during the ATS, we use the MRI to do the dose calculation. So we need the bulk density assignment. And uh, everyone should be very clear about what they are doing because uh, during the uh, online adaptation, everyone would be very nervous. So the oncologists need to know whether he or she would like to recontact uh, the GTV or the GTV and CTV and what, what kind of margin uh, he or she would like to give. Because this would, uh, this would be a very uh, a stressful environment when we do the real-time hand adaptation. So in conclusion, there are uh, additional considerations when we design our care protocols and commissioning for the uh, ML NAC. And, that's, and there is no uh, very uh, uh, standard or well-established uh, protocol for this. So, uh, it is suggested to uh, read through those uh, uh, literatures to see how uh, you, uh, you can design the protocols and choose the correct tools for your department. Uh, the MRE lag actually enables a lot of visibility and there is no such thing as a routine workflow in the MRE lag yet. Um, so uh, there are lots of different groups. They are, uh, uh, they are developing their own protocol to make use of the power of the MR imaging at the same time uh, cons uh, compromising the treatment duration, the manpower consideration. And yeah, there are still a lot of ongoing development in this field. So with this, I would like to uh, acknowledge my supervisor and my colleagues at the CHK Medical Center. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Wilfred and Marcus for their uh, uh, personal conversation in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic there that we could not travel around and the uh, conversation were very helpful to us. And in this uh, pandemic, uh, the letter has also uh, very supportive to our uh, implementation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew, for the very detailed talk and all these uh, detailed procedures that you've shown us. Now, um, we will leave the questions to the end of today's talk. So uh, let's welcome our second speaker today. Uh, 
our second speaker is Dr. Nelson Fong. Dr. Nelson Fong obtained his PhD at the Oxford University and is working as a physicist at the Pamela U. Nodosol Eastern Hospital in Hong Kong. He is a certified radiotherapy physicist with special interests in stereotactic radiotherapy, uncertainty analysis of highly precise radiotherapy treatment, as well as automation of radiotherapy planning, including auto contouring and plan optimization. He is in charge of commissioning and implementation of the Hyperarch system in his hospital, which was then the first Hyperarch system in Hong Kong. And he is responsible for the treatment planning and quality assurance of this true modality. Today, his topic is single isocenter multilesion, stereotactic radio surgery, and radiotherapy. Now, stop sharing. Nelson, you've got to the stage now. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Michael. Um, let me start sharing the screen. Um, can you see, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, Let's go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Oh, so the topic of my talk today is on um, single isocenter multi-target stereotactic radio surgery. Um, here is um, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about in this short presentation. I'll first give a brief introduction to SRS in general and um, discuss why we need single isocenter treatment for multi-lesion cases. Then we'll talk about the general workflow and discuss the um, basic principles um, behind each of these process and some of the issues or challenges that we might encounter. And finally, we'll discuss some of the key components that we need to consider um, when commissioning a new single isocenter SRS program. So stereotactic radio surgery is first developed, oh, sorry, it's first developed by the pioneer Lars Lexell, um, who was a new surgeon based in Sweden. And back in the 1940s, um, new surgery was very risky and the mortality rate was very high. Also, no treatment was available at the time for deeply seated tumors that are non-operable. So in order to tackle these problems, Lexo has envisaged a new non-surgical technique to treat this tumor using ionizing radiation. And um, initially he has tried um, various technique involving um, orthogonal X-rays or even protons, but it eventually is settled with using multiple focusing COBUS-60 sources, which enables the delivery of high radiation doses under the treatment target. And this has resulted in the first prototype of the gamma knife um, that was used clinically to treat patients in um, 1968. And in parallel to the development of gamma knife, um, there was also a rapid development in the um, CRM Linux for conventional fractionated radiotherapy. Late in the 1980s, people also began to use this Linux for SRS treatment, and both cone based and MLC based techniques were developed. And as the technology advanced, the SRS treatment also supported in more and more Linux systems, such as the CyberKnife, the Tomotherapy, and recently, CEPX. And today we'll be focusing on the single isocenter multi-target SRS technique, which was developed specifically for um, CRM Linux. The signature of the SRS is the use of ultra high dose and hypofractionation. And these two combined result in a high biological effective dose that could um, kill the tumor cells. The choice of the prescription um, would be dependent on the tumor volume. As the tumor volume gets larger, the amount of normal brain tissues that get irradiated also increases. And so a lower prescription dose can be tolerated. For example, for brain metastasis cases, the prescription... Oh. Okay. Um, for example, for brain metastasis cases, the prescription dose could be as high as 24 gray in one fractions for tumor with diameter less than two centimeters and as low as 15 gray for larger tumors with three to four centimeters, according to the RTOG 9005 protocol. Fractionation is another way to reduce the effective dose to the normal tissues and three fractions may be used for tumor larger than two centimeters or for surgical cavity, while five fractions can be used when tumors are in very close proximity to vital um, critical organs, such as the brainstem. And to minimize the dose to the um, adjacent normal tissues, the dose distribution should have very sharp fall off. 
And this can be facilitated by allowing hotspots um, inside the target. This differs significantly from the concept of conventional radiotherapy, where a flat dose distribution is preferred. And with such sharp dose fall off, um, we need the treatment to be exceptionally precise and typically accuracy within one to two millimeter range is required. With better imaging detection and improvement in systemic treatment, there has been an increasing number of patients presented with multiple brain metastasis. And traditionally, um, whole brain RT was the standard of care for this group of patients, as no survival benefit can be seen by giving additional SRS compared to whole brain RT alone. However, the, um, this whole brain RT paradigm has changed as two large studies from Europe and Japan show that um, SRS alone can lead to better neocognitive function without compromising overall survival compared to SRS plus whole brain RT. While the distance progression rate could be higher, the whole brain RT can be delayed and used as last resort to prevent neocognitive decline as much as possible. And since then, um, SRS, SRS alone has replaced whole brain RT as the standard of care for patients with um, limited brain metastasis. And also in 2014. Oh, sorry. And in 2014, another large multi institutional prospective study from Japan showed that initial treatment for patients with five to 10 brain metastases is not inferior compared to patients with two to four brain metastases in terms of overall survival. And this suggests that patients with extensive brain metastases are also suitable for SRS treatment. In traditional SRS, one plan is created for each lesion and the answer center is um, often placed at the lesion center. And during treatment, only one lesion is irradiated at a time and the patient would need to be repositioned for each plane. So effectively, the overall treatment time would be proportional to the number of lesions treated and could become um, impractically long for multi-lesion cases. So in order to save time, the single answer center approach um, is developed. It works by allowing um, simultaneous irradiation um, of the lesions, as you can see in the beam type view here. And this effectively shortens the beam on time of the treatment. Additional time is also safe um, as no repositioning is required since only a single isocenter is used. And besides of um, treatment time, there's also a slight advantage in the treatment planning based on a single isocenter, as it might be difficult to get good conformity for individual lesions due to cross-firing from contributing plans um, using the traditional multi isocenter approach. Here shows a typical workflow for single isocenter multi-target treatment. First, we need to um, define the anatomy of the patient relative to the linear coordinate system. And this can be done by performing CD simulation and immobilization is required to keep the patient's position stable during simulation and treatment. And besides of CT, MRI is also necessary for visualizing the lesion as it offers a much better soft tissue contrast. Registration is then performed to align the orientation of CT and MRI images so that the target and OAR can be controlled onto the pending CT based on the MRI images. This is followed by um, treatment planning, which involves um, beam arrangement and plan optimization. The optimized plan is then reviewed by the clinical oncologist. But before the um, plan is ready for treatment, quality assurance must be um, in place to ensure the treatment accuracy. And typically, the plan will be um, independently ver verified by another physicist. Um, then patient-specific patient QA will be performed to verify the geometric and dosimetric accuracy of the plan. And before treatment delivery, um, machine QA should be performed to ensure the machine is working properly. And this is very important because um, only one fraction or maybe a few fractions are involved. And the fact that we are giving a really high dose, so any machine malfunctioning could incur severe harm to the patient. And after the um, machine QA, the plan um, will be ready to treat. During the treatment session, the patient will be um, immobilized in the same way um, in, as in the CT simulation. Image guidance um, 
is then performed to position the patient as planned, then the beam is turned over treatment. And finally, the intrafractional motion of the patient should be monitored to make sure the patient is at the right position for the entire treatment. So now let's talk about each of these process um, in more detail. First, immobilization. There are two ways you can immobilize the patient for SRS treatment. The traditional approach is to use the stereotactic head frame, which can be fixed to the patient's skull with um, screws penetrating the skin. And such frame defines the reference coordinate system for patient, which is used for treatment planning. And the setup is um, very rigid, so you can expect minimal intrafractional motion. However, these procedures are very invasive and uncomfortable for the patient. So the entire treatment has to be done in the same day and fractionated treatment is not an option. So with advances in um, image guidance technology, the conventional head frame has largely been replaced by the famous approach. It uses thermoplastic mask um, it uses thermoplastic mask to immobilize the patient's head, and this mask can be taken on and off um, so that the patient can go home while the physicists are busy doing the treatment planning and QA. And since this mask are not entirely rigid, there might be slight discrepancy in the treatment position, but this can all be corrected on the couch during um, image guidance. Such non-invasive approach improves the patient comfort and allows fractionated treatment. But the only concern is that the patient's head can still move inside the mask during treatment, and such intrafractional motion should be monitored. And if tolerance is exceeded, the treatment should be stopped, and the patient will need to be repositioned again using image guidance before continuing treatment. Some masks are designed with this in mind and allow the face to be tracked using optical service mon monitoring during treatment. And patients, particularly um, those who are claustrophobic, may find this open mask to be more comfortable um, than ones that cover the face entirely. And for imaging, since the targets we're dealing with is often very small, we need to acquire images of very thin slides to avoid partial volume effect. And this is the case for both um, CT and MRI. The addition of um, contrast agents could help um, improve the visualization of the lesion. For brain metastasis cases, the tumor would tend to be um, hyper intense in both CT and T1 weighted MRI images. Contrast delay could also allow more time for the contrast agent to leak through the defected capillaries that lacks the bubbling barrier, which could further improve the contrast. MRI has a much um, better soft tissue contrast than CT and is typically used for defining the target boundary. And since this brain metastasis usually grow at a very fast pace, the interval between the MRI and treatment day should not exceed two weeks to avoid geometrical mist of the target due to tumor progression. And we should also be aware of the presence of the MRI distortion, um, particularly for the free TMRI scanners. For the CTMR registration, rigid registration by bone usually produce pretty good results and the quality of the registration should be verified and this can be done by checking the correspondence of landmark structures such as the dual surface, ventricular system, bones, or even the tumor itself. So before we talk about some of the considerations in treatment planning, let's discuss how we quantify the plan quality for multi-lesion SRS plans. Like any other um, radiotherapy plans, we'll have to look at the OAR doses and individual target coverage. Quality index, such as the conformity index, gradient index, and homogeneity index, are also commonly used for plan evaluation and should be reported for individual lesions. The conformity index will tell us about how tight the dose is conformed to the target. The CIRTOG is a commonly reported quality index. It's simply given by the prescription isodose volume divided by the target volume. However, it doesn't address the situation when the target is not covered. So it can still give you a perfect conformity index of one, even if the target is completely missed. I would recommend the use of CI PEDIC instead because it penalizes both target volume that's not covered by the, uh, not covered by, by the prescription dose 
and also the prescription dose outside the target volume. So it gives a much better representation of the um, actual conformity. The gradient index will tell us about the rapidity of the dose fall off, and it's given by the 50% um, isodose volume divided by the prescription isodose volume. It is generally a function of um, target volume. And as the uh, target volume is smaller, the GI would tend to be larger. Um, but sometimes we could get into trouble using these indexes when the isodose line covering individual targets join up. When this happens, instead of reporting the indexes for individual lesion, one could try computing just one index for the PDVs combined. However, this, this might not always work, particularly in cases when targets are prescribed at different dose level, in which case the indexes would not be very meaningful and one have to rely on justifying the plan quality by simply studying the distributions of isodose line. And finally, the homogeneity index will tell us about the maximum hotspot in the treatment plan. And usually an SRS plan's hotspot within target is a good thing as it could lead to faster dose fall off and increase the likelihood of eradicating radi radio resistant hypoxic cells there. However, we might have to be careful of allowing large volume of very high dose which might increase the treatment toxicity. For normal brain toxicity, the V12 gray is, a commonly, used, is commonly used for predicting the risk of radiation necrosis um, for single lesion cases, and is typically constrained to less than 10 cc in SRS plans. But one has to be careful applying this in the multi-lesion cases, as one would expect the complication risk to be smaller for the same total V12 especially for isolated targets that are far away from each other. As the V12 gray for this lesion um, is not going to affect the radiation necrosis elsewhere in the brain. And for fractionated treatment, there's generally no um, consensus on the normal dose limit. Recent publications suggest that um, radiation necrosis risk can be kept under 10% if the V20 gray for three fraction or V24 gray for five fractions of the tissue volume is less than 20 cc. And uh, finally, we um, will also have to look at the low dose spillage, which are typically um, evaluated using the V4 gray. With growing interest and in increasing demand in single isocent SRS, various dedicated commercial solutions have been developed. And two of the most commonly used package worldwide are the um, Farian High Park and Brain Labs Element. Both of these systems utilize non coplanar arcs to enhance target conformity and to reduce dose spillage. And in terms of MLC trajectories, Elements uses the more conventional dynamic conformal arc, where the MLC conforms to the outline of the PDV as the gantry rotate. While Hypart uses VMAT, which allows MLC modulations and also variation of gantry speed and dose rate. The MLC width could have a significant effect on the SRS plan quality, particularly for um, dynamic conform arc technique. And generally, um, the finer the MLC, the better the target shape could be traced, which leads to better conformity. Um, however, the effect is less obvious for VMAT as the MLC does not have to conform the target. And in our experience, typical clinical goals could be fulfilled in most cases using the um, five MML MLCs for FEMAT high park plans. And this is in agreement with studies as compared pans generated by five millimeter MLC and 2.5 uh, mm MLC. And they show that while the MLC could cause only a small change in the total MU and conformity index, but the those spillage such as the um, V30 and V50, the normal brain could increase by around 20%. So far, all is well for single isocenter SRS. The treatment could be much faster than the traditional approach. So why isn't everybody doing this? One of the major concerns is that the treatment accuracy is very sensitive to the rotational errors that originate about the isocenter. As you can see in this diagram, a larger shift can be induced for the same rotational error um, as the target to isocenter distance increases. 
and the source of the rotation error could include the mechanical accuracies of the gantry kilometer count angles or misalignment between the imaging systems and the radiation delivery systems. The setup error could also be another contribution, for example, online registration error, or in cases when the residual rotational errors could not be corrected if six degree of freedom couch is not available. Some other rotational error also exist, but they are not necessarily um, about the isocenter. For example, the um, interfectional head rotation during treatment delivery. In this case, the rotation is originated at the neck, so the target shift is not so much affected by the target to isocenter distance, but rather the target neck distance. And as a result, not only single isocenter treatment is affected, the traditional multiple isocenter approach could also be prone to such kind of rotational errors. The choice of the isocenter placement um, can help mitigate the rotational um, errors that originate about the isocenter. And to, to illustrate this, let's consider a case when we have two lesion, a big lesion and a small lesion, and also an OAR nearby the bigger lesion. If we choose the isocenter at the center of mass of all target, the isocenter is going to lean towards the bigger target. And in such a way, we can reduce the shift for, for the bigger lesion. And since for the same amount of shift, the target volume missed by the bigger target is larger than the smaller target, by putting the isocenter near the bigger target can help to reduce the overall target volume missed. However, such approach could lead to a larger percentage loss in the target coverage of the smaller tumor. And this can be avoided by employing an opposite approach by placing the isocenter at the center of um, inverse mass. And in this approach, the smaller mass is going to um, have a heavier weighting. So the isocenter will be closer to the smaller lesion. The percentage coverage loss of the bigger lesion is not so much affected um, by the shift. So um, this approach can effectively reduce the overall percentage coverage of all lesions. Another approach is to take a balance between these two strategies by placing the isocenter at the geometric centroid of the center of masses. And if critical organ is of first priority, we can even put it at the region where the OAR and PDV overlaps, so as to reduce the risk of overdosing the critical organ. Those bridging between adjacent lesion is another challenge in single isocenter treatment planning. And this could be caused by the um, island blocking problem. It happens when two or more targets shares the same MLC pair, resulting in an area of normal brain tissues that's not blocked by the MLCs. Now, there are several ways um, we could do to alleviate this problem. The solution that is employed by High Park is to optimize the collimator angles so that the unblocked area is being minimized throughout the arc. Another approach employed by elements is to avoid such problem entirely by making sure that the same MLC pair are open for just one lesion for each arc. And in this approach, the lesions are separated into several subgroups and each of which will be treated using individual arc. Finally, further reduction of um, the bridging dose can be achieved by inverse optimization using a bridge breaker pseudo structures. In treatment delivery, exact track and cone beam CT are two of the most commonly used image guidance technology. Exact track allows two orthogonal KVX rays to be acquired, which provide three dimensional information about patient position. These images are then compared to the digitally reconstructed radiograph so that the six degree of freedom shift can be computed for aligning the patient to the plane position. Cone beam CT can be used to produce 3D images of the patient at treatment position. These can be directly compared slide by slide to the planning CT. Like the planning CT, um, the cone beam CT should be reconstructed to thin slices to enhance the registration accuracy. Oops, sorry. And in addition to bony structures, Soft tissues are also visible and allow us to assess if there is any significant change of the brain um, that might affect the treatment accuracy. Increasing the number of projections or tube current can help visualize the soft tissue better, but it could also increase the imaging dose, so um, one has to find a fine balance. 
X-ray track, however, cannot be used to see the soft tissue, but it has the capability of verifying the patient position at non-zero couch angles. And also the acquisition could be very fast, um, unlike Comium CT. Of course, once we have determined the shift by image guidance, we need to have the six degree, six degree freedom couch to move the patient to the right position automatically. And as we have mentioned before, the rotational errors could lead to significant shift deletions that are far away from the isocenter. So having a couch that can correct the pitch, roll, and yaw is absolutely necessary for single isocenter treatment. Ele electronic portal imaging, track, and uh, optical service guidance are tools that we could use for monitoring the interfractional motion. And out of these three methods, the EPID imaging has the most amount of limitations or restrictions. For example, it is unable to determine the motion in the six degree of freedom at a non-zero couch angle, as lateral images are prevented due to the possible gantry collision to the couch. Also, the um, accuracy could be limited due to poor contrast with MV beam, and the imaging dose is typically quite high, a few centigrade to the whole brain per image. But the good news is it doesn't require any additional accessory to be installed, as is um, usually already equipped in most Linux. Now, exact track and service monitoring are better options if available. They can be used to determine the six degree of freedom shift at all couch angles. And one millimeter accuracy could be achieved in both systems if properly used. Service monitoring um, could also provide continuous monitoring um, and no imaging dose is concerned. But false, pos false positive could sometimes occur as the accuracy could be affected by multiple factors such as in the choice of the regional interest, skin tone, or even the ambient light conditions. For patient-specific quality assurance, true composite measurement in phantom are considered golden standard as the measured dose distribution can be closely um, related to the delivered dose to the patient. The choice of the detectors is very important for accurate measurement. First, the detector needs to be very small to prevent the uh, volume averaging effect. Also, a lot of the detectors would have directional dependence for non-copainer beams. This should be corrected in a measurement analysis. Of course, um, it would be best to simply use detectors with neglectable directional dependence. And if we are trying to measure the dose profile, the sampling resolution should be sufficiently fine to verify the high dose distribution characteristics of the small target. The most classic solution, excuse me, is to use the micro ion chambers and films However, they could be extremely time consuming and may take um, maybe more than an hour for each lesion. Recently, several commercial solutions have emerged with the aim of streamlining this QA process. And both Sun Nuclear and IPA have developed um, two dimensional detector arrays that behave like digital films and can support measurement of non cool planar beams. Also, no post processing is required an instant result can be obtained straight after the measurement. Here shows some example of the measurements from film and from the sun nuclear map check. And typically one measurement is required for one lesion, unless we can cut through two or more lesions in the same measurement plane like this one. And regarding the tolerance for patient specific QA, there's currently no consensus of what those tolerance is going to be but typically three to 5% are used. And also in SRS plans are typically associated with um, very sharp dose fall. So the geometrical uncertainty could translate into large dose differences. The spatial tolerance for the QA should ideally be equal to or less than the PDV margin. Otherwise we might actually pass a plan that could potentially miss the target. Combining these two criteria um, would give us a typical gamma criteria of 3% one millimeter or 5% one millimeter when a PDV margin of one millimeter is used. Here shows the result of the sun nuclear metric measurement for high part plants that are being treated in our center. And the accuracy is um, pretty good even for off access cases. And typically a gamma passing rate of um, more than 95% can be achieved using a criterion of 3% one millimeter. 
The Sun nuclear map check also supports the calculated shift functions that can um, optimize the spatial agreement between the measured and planned dose distribution. And such shift represent the setup and delivery uncertainty of our Linux system. Combining the error um, from interfractional motion, which um, can be measured by comparing the pre-treatment and post-treatment convium CT, we arrived at um, a total 3D delivery error of around one millimeter for our high back systems. Of course, there are other uncertainties such as the registration error, which could be significant if there is large change to the brain anatomy from CT to MR. For example, due to reduction of edema after taking steroid. Contouring error is another contribution, um, particularly in the post-operative cavity cases. And these uncertainties can lead to target miss, which can be reduced by adding a PDB margin. However, the introduction of the PDB margin could also increase the amount of normal brain that get irradiated. There's generally no consensus of what the margin should be used. It really depends on the uncertainty of the SRS system use, and also some clinical judgment needs to be made is how this uncertainty translates into clinical effect is not clearly defined. In our center, we use a two millimeter margin for GDV less than 0.5 cc, and one millimeter margin for GDV larger than 0.5 cc for intact lesions. The smaller target are given, uh, are given a larger margin because their percentage target coverage is more affected by the delivery uncertainty and at the same time, the extra normal brain tissues that needs to be irradiated needs to be radiated is less compared to the bigger lesions. For surgical cavity, um, two millimeters margin is given to account for the increase in contouring uncertainties. For extensive multiple brain uh, metastasis cases, it would be impractical to do true composite measurement for all of the lesions, and it would simply be too time consuming. And in this case, it would be much more practical to spot check uh, the dose for just one or two lesions and use other QA methods that sample every part of every field to verify the overall accuracy of the treatment. And examples would um, could include delta four measurement with couch set to zero degrees, um, portal dosimetry, et cetera, et cetera. And alternatively, calculation-based QA, especially one that's based on a um, treatment log file, will also be very useful. For um, machine QA, the AAPM RSS medical physics guideline has provide, provide us the minimum list of what QA we should do and how frequently we should do it. In particular, an emphasis was placed on the radiation isocentricity, IGRT accuracy and couch accuracy, as well as annual end-to-end -end testing. However, that list um, would be suitable for traditional multiple isocenter SRS, but if we are doing single isocenter treatment, there are more things that we need to check. For example, the um, mechanical accuracies of the gantry collimator as off-axis lesion are sensitive to rotational error as we discussed before. Also, we need uh, to check not just the MLC that are close to the center, but also MLC that are off-axis that would um, also be used to conform target in single isocenter treatment. This is a fairly long, checklist and what might probably need automated QA tools for this task. One example is the um, machine performance check for Trubium Linux from Farian. And regarding the international guideline, the um, TG362 is the dedicated AAPM report for multi-lesion SRS. However, currently is still under, under development, but hopefully it will be available soon. And finally, let's discuss some of the key components we need to consider when commissioning the new single isocenter SRS program. We need to start from assessing the performance of basic component that could affect the accuracy of off access treatment. Particular emphasis is on the mechanical and IGRT um, accuracy that can induce rotational errors. For example, the stability of the pitch and roll angles during couch rotation alignment of the image guidance systems in relation to the radiation delivery system, et cetera. Most of this task um, may have been performed during the Linux acceptance already, but if we are using the Linux for single isocenter SRS purpose, we need to impose a tighter tolerance 
and decide if we should prohibit the use of any particular collimator or count angles if necessary. The uncertainty of the off-axis irradiation could also be assessed using um, the off-axis Winston-Lux test. Basically, like traditional Winston-Lux, we have a phantom inside which um, contains a metallic bowl. And instead of placing it at the isocenter, we position the phantom at an off isocenter position using image guidance. For example, in this case, we have placed the phantom to the right of the isocenter by nine centimeters. Then we take the electronic photo image images of various projection. The deviation between the bowl center and radiation center for each projection is expected to be worse as the target to isocenter distance increases. This could be contributed by the increasing shift um, induced by rotational uncertainty of the machine and also larger radiation focusing spot size um, introduced by gantry second hysteresis or um, MLC inaccuracies. With all, the inf uh, with all the information about the machine uncertainties, we can determine if we need any restriction of, of the maximum target to isocenter distance. And besides of assessing the machine uncertainties, we also need to configure and tune the beam model to make sure that, um, that those calculation is accurate. Um, these procedures are specific to the treatment planning system or beam model use. Some calculation model requires the input of small field profiles, PDD, um, and alpha factors. And this requires careful choices of detector, setup, and corrections, excuse me, to get accurate measurement results. You can find um, comprehensive guidelines on small field dosimetry in um, TRS-483 or the TG-155. Now let's take um, ACROS or AAA as an example. The input of um, small field data is actually not necessary unless one elects to use very small jaw size. And only a few parameters such as the um, focus spot size, MOC transmission, or um, dosimetric leaf gap needs to be tuned to get accurate result. Finally, it's crucial to verify the accuracy of the whole SRS delivery systems from imaging to those delivery. And that can be accomplished by performing end-to-end -end test with an appropriate phantom. This is an example of an in-house end-to-end test performed for a high path plan um, that is used to treat two lesions on different dose levels. And in this case, we have used uh, the ion chamber and film to measure the dose distribution delivered. External audit will also be um, very useful to check whether the SRS systems is up to international standard and currently, the IROC Houston can provide a head stereotactic phantom containing TLDs and radiographic films for end-to-end -end testing purpose. RT Safe also provides an attractive end-to-end -end test solution. It uses 3D printed anthropomorphic phantom and inside which is filled with gel dosimeter. And following irradiation, the signals can be read using an MRI and the entire 3D dose distribution or even DVH of individual targets can be obtained. So uh, in conclusion, um, technological advances has enabled the possibility of single isocenter SRS treatment so that the treatment time for multi-target can, can be significantly reduced. However, there could be additional uncertainty associated with this new technology so diligent quality assurance and thorough commissioning should be performed to ensure the accuracy of the whole SRS delivery system. So that's the end of my presentation and thank you for listening. Thank you, Nelson. There's another very detailed presentation from commissioning all the way to treatment delivery. So um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Our last speaker today is Professor Jane Kai. Professor Jane Kai is the Director of Medical Physics and the Chair of Postgraduate Scheme in Health Technology of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. He is an adjunct professor of Duke University and a fellow of the AAPM. Professor Kai has served as the Senior Associate Editor for the Red Journal 
and currently he is the deputy editor of the journal Medical Physics, as well as the associate editor or editorial board members of many other journals. He is a medical physicist, trainer, and educator, and he has very strong interest in medical physics research. He's been the principal investigators of over 40 projects, received numerous awards, and published over 130 peer-reviewed papers. He has special interest in advanced radiotherapy physics, and today he will talk to us about artificial intelligence in radiotherapy. So the floor is yours, Jing. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee, for your introduction. <clears throat> uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So uh, today is my great pleasure to share with you some of the uh, recent developments in artificial intelligence in radiotherapy. So currently we know we're living in an era of precision medicine. And precision medicine is also termed as Personalized medicine is a medical procedure that separate patients into smaller groups with medical decisions, practice, and interventions are being tailored to each individual patient and based on their uh, predicted response. And uh, I would like to emphasize this. So not only we modify our plan for the best of the patient, but at the same time, we can predict response for each patient. And this is a key feature of the uh, precision medicine. So for RT, as the audience are mostly in RT today, so I assume you are familiar with the process, I won't go through that. But for precision RT, we're having more requirements. For example, uh, precision simulation, target delineation, and RT planning, and also precision RT treatment delivery. And as the previous speaker has mentioned, uh, precision treatment response prediction, and this is something new that are not currently practiced in uh, routine, and precision detection of tumor recurrence and other things. And uh, because of that, you know, we have a number of advanced RT techniques that are developed recently, especially IGRT, SBRT. And all of this require accurate tumor delineation, proper motion management, and sophisticated dose calculation, and many other things. So what are the challenges in precision RT? You can simply see, you know, they fit into a few different categories, such as image quality, right? We want to have higher tumor soft tissue contrast, you know, high, repeat, high repeatability, robustness of these images and uh, minimize image artifacts. In terms of plant quality, right? We want a higher, less variant contours from oncologists, from dosimetrists, the accuracy of image registration needs to be improved, as we know. And planning, replanning, optimization algorithms and QA as well, of course, very important. Another thing is time efficiency. You know, we're dealing with a increasing number of patients, especially in this area, and time efficiency is very, very important. And decision making and many other things, including new treatment methods like immunotherapy. So AI, as you know, has been a very hot topic in recent years. It, have been, it has been a proven technology that can advance the technology, uh, including RT in many areas. So this slide here gives us a very nice summary of these advances AI for precision RT, as you can see in each step of the process, you know, from the treatment decision to imaging simulation, to treatment planning, to approval and QA, delivery and follow up. The AI has been applied in many of the cases and uh, promising results has been published in 
you know, recent years. So early in 2017, um, Professor Xinglei of you know, Stanford University and I and um, Dr. Uh, Krubowski from Emory, they worked together on an article in medical physics discussing you know, how AI will change the landscape of medical physics research and practice. And later on, we did a follow-up work on you know, how we, you know, how we could and, and should we include AI be part of the medical physics graduate program. And, and you know, there are important messages from uh, this article, such as you know, the impact of AI is a multi-effect. The output, the outcome ranges from simply enhancing to completely replacing its human counterparts. So the question is not whether our field will be changed by AI, but to what level. And as time goes on, we see uh, you know, more and you know, major significant changes uh, actually has been happening in the past few years. So in the following slides, I'd like to give you some uh, examples uh, of the research that we do in this area. And my research has been mostly focused on you know, MRI and MRI guided uh, radiation therapy. And this itself is a, a hot topic uh, in the past you know, five years. So um, I'd like to show you the use of AI for you know, staging, for simulation planning, uh, assessment, uh, the different process of uh, MRI guided RT. So this is going to be a number of different publications and all different topics in the area of MRI guided RT. For example, uh, as many of you may know that for MRI guided RT, right, um, we would like to uh, perform MRI alone based treatment planning. Uh, so an earlier question in the chat box asking about this, I think. It's an excellent question. And to do that, uh, the first thing we need to do is to convert MRI to a CT uh, for getting the necessary electron density information for those calculations. There are actually a number of publications that have been done on this area. And in our research uh, published a couple of years ago in medical physics, in particular, uh, developed a multi-channel multi-pass uh, network. As you can see here, the advantage of this technique is that it actually utilizes the information from multi-parametric MRI. So not only one single MRI, but including you know, T1, T2, EWI, and even contrasting his MRI if it's available. And the network optimized to extract information from each of these um, modality and to produce the best MRI, uh, best CT images. So if you look at the uh, image here, right, it shows you the comparison between the uh, short CT and the real CT. You can actually do a quick visualization and see the differences, uh, which can also be seen in the difference map. So this technique actually becoming mature and mature. I believe there are already commercial products on this. Another very recent publication in the Red Journal from our group is only uh, probably half a year ago. Uh, it deals with a very interesting question that is, you know, we use a lot of the uh, gadolinium based contrast enhanced MRI in RT for tumor volume delineation, right? We do that for brain, uh, for the head neck, uh, breast uh, quite often. And we know that gadolinium has many side effects, right? Um, especially for RT patients who will, you know, continuously uh, having treatment for multiple fractions and multiple assessments. So I think uh, repeated use of gadolinium is a, a potentially an issue. And in recent years, there are a few studies trying to investigate the feasibility of using AI to produce contrast enhanced MRI without using gadolinium. So this is a very 
important clinical uh, application. And, and we did a study for uh, neuropharyngeal carcinoma patients. And the uh, algorithm, as you can see here at the bottom, is called a multi-modality guided uh, synergistic network. And using this uh, network, we are able to uh, have you know, multiple input like T1, T2, and then convert to a contrast enhanced MRI without uh, actual gadolinium injection. So the image on the right shows you a few different uh, examples. As you can see, the real time, uh, sorry, the real contrast T1 with the MRI. On the left, the middle is a synthetic uh, contrast MRI and different map on the right. So this is a very recent publication only about uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, I think it's a very interesting cl clinical application. So as you know, uh, many patients will, deliver, will uh, develop radiation dermatitis during the radiation treatment. So we particularly look at uh, NPC patients again and many of the patients, as you can see some of the example here, uh, develop different levels of RD. And the current assessment method is based on some international guidelines, such as RTOG, and it involves uh, human assessors right, to uh, either weekly or more frequently assess the uh, progress of the RD and provide you know, assistance or uh, treatments uh, based on that. So this human-based process is quite time-consuming and uh, inter-observer uh, variation is quite large. So there is a need actually to develop some AI-based method. So uh, this method that we developed will based on the photo taken you know, during the treatment and perform automatic segmentation of the region of interest and based on a radiomics based classification method to automatically assess the grade of RD. Uh, so this work uh, is currently published based on you know, more than 1,200 photos uh, of the patients and achieve a overall accuracy of 83%. The actually is quite good. Um, it's um, similar to the average performance of the human assessors, as you can see here. So another application is called MRI super resolution via realistic downsampling. And this is a relatively technical development. Uh, the clinical scenario is like this, you know, considering MRI in RT, for example, uh, due to the restriction of, of time, we would like to acquire uh, data as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, but uh, usually that leads to uh, lower image resolution, so the image is not uh, clear enough. So people develop different methods to superficially increase the image resolution so that you can uh, see a high quality image. So in this case, uh, we developed this uh, neural network to uh, first simulate a more realistic uh, raw data of the image, which has lower resolution, and then through a uh, AI algorithm to generate super resolution MRI. So if you can see the example at the bottom here, right, you can see um, the improvement really in image quality through the AI. So this is another uh, recent developments in 4D MRI. Uh, we have been working on this for a long time, more than 10 years using different uh, methods. But recently by uh, applying AI, uh, we can achieve a lot more uh, good things about this technology. Uh, what we did here was based on a commercially available MRI sequence, we can acquire low resolution MRI. So the image quality is not that great and the contrast is not that great. So through AI, we are able to translate the image information, especially the motion information into 
high resolution, high contrast MRI. So you can actually generate multiple contrast for the MRI with high resolution based on that. Okay, of course, through some AI recon reconstruction. So this example bottom here, you can see the first one is the actual image and the rest of four, you know, in T1, T2, DWI waiting, they are all actually reconstructed based on the AI algorithm that we developed. So I believe this uh, great enhancement really facilitates the clinical application of, for the MRI for liver cancer uh, SBRT treatment. So uh, this is a, a interesting study that um, I think has a potential application for image guidance, especially you know, uh, the OBI patient positioning. Uh, as you know, you know, when we take an OBI image uh, in the lungs, for example, the image quality sometimes can be degraded because of the bones, right? The bones may uh, obstruct the uh, tumor. Uh, so there is a need to enhance the quality of that, maybe by removing the bone structure. And uh, for that purpose, we develop a deep learning based bone suppression in chest videography using uh, CT derived features. So this is a very new uh, uh, idea, okay? Uh, so this technique shows uh, we could actually uh, remove largely the bone features from the chest X-ray or from the OBI so that we can see uh, the lung tumors much better, especially for smaller uh, lung tumors. I think this is uh, also clinically useful for lung SPRT applications. And the next one, I need to give you a little bit of background uh, in terms of the functional lung avoidance RT or FLOT. The idea is actually quite simple. We know the patient have uh, different lung functions in different regions, but currently we assume they're all the same in terms of function. So there's the idea to you know, avoid irradiating the high functional lung regions by uh, you know, change the beam angle uh, accordingly based on the uh, function information. So there are different methods to get the lung function information, such as from the SPECT, from hyperpolarized gas MRI, and other things. And also there's a new method to uh, mathematically derive that function based on deformable image registration. There are many works on that actually. Um, but recent developments shows there are large variation uh, between different methods. So to solve that problem, we're thinking maybe we can use AI and deep learning to derive lung functions from CT or 4D CT images. So we have a algorithm you know, based on uh, CT uh, to uh, derive perfusion, lung perfusion images directly from CT without any uh, contrast injection. Okay, so this really solved the problem of uh, inconvenience, you know, by applying a different technology or and uh, require more time from the clinicians, from the patient to do this. So if we can get the patient CT or 4D CT and apply this technology to derive functional images, and this process becomes much easier in terms of, you know, uh, implementing the functional, Im uh, functional imaging guided RT. So this is also a recent publication in the Red Journal. So in the second part of my talk, I will uh, switch the gear a little bit, uh, still on AI, but more specifically on the big data and radiomics. So you may heard about the big data, right? Um, it certainly has a large volume of data, but not only, not only that, it has high velocity, high variety. Uh, it also means you will have different kinds of data, right? Different kinds of data. And that feeds over RT, scenario very well because we're dealing with different kinds of images and clinical data and dose data and different things. And radiomics is a method that can extract a large amount of features from medical images. And the features usually cannot be seen by human eyes, have the potential to uncover some hidden information of the disease and help clinical decision making. For example, you know, this study shows you know, almost eight years ago, that for RT patients, uh, each patient 
has around eight gigabytes of data. Uh, I think nowadays it could be even bigger. So uh, RT data uh, has the volume, has the variety, and this is a good um, application area for uh, radiomics and big data. And for people who are not familiar with the process, this slide shows you the general workflow of radiomics. For example, you know you begin with some images, T1, T2, or CT, or PET, any kind of images. And there will be some image processing, pre-processing to like normalize the data or clean up some artifacts. And uh, image segmentation, this is routinely done in RT, so that's not a problem. So here you choose the region that you want to study. For example, the tumor maybe, or the node, or some OAR. And for that region of interest, you're gonna extract a large number of features uh, of different categories, like the shape feature, first order texture features. And you could end up with hundreds or even thousands of features per region of interest. And with this large number of features, uh, we then apply different algorithms to select the features that are mostly important. Um, there, there are many different ways to do this, and it can be quite complicated, actually. And the final step is to uh, build models for prediction. Okay? And uh, the last two steps are heavily involved in terms of developing new uh, methods. So there are a lot of studies being done so far on the radiomics, but the current uh, radiomics have some limitations. For example, mostly are retrospective and mostly are with only internal validation. External validation is rare, but becoming more and more. And a limited patient number and data variety and difficult comparing model performance among studies. Uh, people may have different models uh, for the same clinical question. And then how we compare the two, exactly there's no way to do that because we're lacking of standardization and transparency in the process. So you may know, you know there are many, many other biomarkers uh, that a more conventional biomarkers has been around for a long time. So radiomics, is just a new model, I mean, new biomarker. And compared to other established biomarkers, there are still a lot of work need to be done because the evidence for radiomics based biomarkers is not strong enough for clinical guidance at the moment. So we kind of you know, summarize the challenges for radiomics that include the data security and sharing, feature robustness and reliability, model reconstruction and applicability. So because of that, uh, there's no published clinical trials yet using radiomics to guide management. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time to talk about each of these challenges. For example, the first one, data security and sharing. I think it's a big issue uh, about the study clinical trials between different hospitals. And of course, there's a big, Thing beyond, uh, uh, you know, most of us can handle. Uh, it requires uh, a huge uh, hospital collaboration and policy change. And also uh, it requires newer methodology. For example, a paper published in Nature recently uh, developed a, a new, you know, decentralized algorithm that allows us to train and test a model in different hospitals without transferring data. In terms of feature robustness and reliability, there's a balance between the two. You cannot require the hospitals to follow you know, exactly uh, the, you know, the protocol uh, using exactly the same image parameters, for example. And that will cause, of course, uh, uh, issues in terms of feature uh, reliability, model re reliability. Um, so we have to achieve a balance uh, between how to maximize the predictive power while retain the generalizability. Just want to give you some examples like, you know, from the same patient, uh, you know, acquire 
twice in the CT. And if you perform feature calculation analysis, and it was found that only 50% of the features actually are, rely, uh, are repeatable. And we also did some uh, study to show that uh, some features, uh, remember there are different categories of features, some features are more re reliable than others, and they're quite, quite different. And the wavelet type of features are more susceptible to uh, perturbations or noise uh, to uh, uh, counter randomization, for example. And also we found that for different images like CT and MRI, they have different uh, reproducibility. So in general, we found that CT has a lower feature reproducibility than MRI. So that means actually MRI features are more reliable. And in terms of methodology, uh, there are different modeling, construction and uh, applicability methods. Um, so this is a very uh, hot research area and people are developing different methods. For example, earlier we developed an ensemble model based iterative feature selection. So this allows us to select the most uh, reliable and uh, correlative features to uh, build the model. And recently we developed an ensemble level method for imbalanced data because in RT applications, we have the issues that many of the events that we concern, for example, uh, distant metastasis uh, or local recurrence it may have a very small percentage of uh, events, meaning there are a small percentage of patients have those kind of events. And for modeling, that's a big issue. So this development uh, in methodology really trying to address those challenges. So in terms of um, you know, feature processing, uh, we are, I mean, there's a trend in the field actually trying to uh, use more data, you know, CT, MRI, different kinds of MRI, as well as, you know, dose data, uh, clinical data, geometric data, all together uh, to uh, create the model. So the model is becoming more and more complicated. You can create different models based on one type of data or combine uh, with different kinds of data. So there's some preliminary study from our group showing, you know, if you use a multi-region multi of interest, multi-omics model, it tends to show better, better results uh, than some single omics models. And um, as it, we can see, things are becoming more and more complex. We need better tools. So we develop a radio uh, therapy data analysis and reporting software, the radar. This allows us to uh, mass process a large number of patients uh, in this research. Uh, this is just a screen capture of the uh, software. So in terms of application of the radiomics, uh, very quickly show you a couple of examples for, uh, this is a study to predict uh, adaptive RT triggered uh, mask AO fitting in NPC patients. Basically we uh, predict which patients were likely to have uh, a loosened mask, you know, during the uh, RT treatment. This is an indicator for uh, our, um, adaptive RT. And this is a study on using MRI radiomics to predict which patients are eligible uh, for uh, ART treatment. Uh, we recently closed the patient uh, study and um, with very promise, promising results, a software also developed to be placed in the hospital for clinical trials. So uh, this is a study more on the technology side, uh, how we can uh, deal with the uh, uh, imbalanced data, as we mentioned earlier, also together with uh, model overfitting. And we have this application for NPC distance, uh, distance metastasis prediction. I won't go through the technical details too much. So um, those are some examples. Uh, there are still challenges in the era of AI and radiomics. For example, how can we balance the accuracy versus in, uh, interpretability? For clinical use, I think uh, clinicians, including medical physicists, are humans. We like to uh, have the capability to explain things. 
and uh, reasoning things. So have a strong interpretability of the model, I think is critically important for um, real practical applications. Uh, but there's a balance between two. So I think this is quite new and we're looking forward to having more uh, research in this area. So I would like to summarize real quick here. That is, you know, how AI and uh, microphysics are related. So this is a article from uh, Nature Physics in recent publications. Uh, it really calls for the physicist to play a more important role in the era of AI. So as you can see from the title, you know, understanding deep learning is also a job for physicists. So I have a quotation here, as you can see the, the quote here, as a physicist, let us embrace machine learning as the new tool in the box and let us use it widely and wisely. But let us also keep in mind that understanding why and how it really works require physics methodology. So you know, not only all the computational um, uh, works, but also how we can perceive this from the physics point of view. Uh, we should not only stand by as this uh, formidable endeavor takes shape. So certainly physics has a more, a more important role in this uh, direction. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the students and collaborators and the funding sources uh, that without them, the uh, research I present today cannot be done. And thank you uh, all of you for attending and the uh, organization uh, for giving me this opportunity to present. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Jay. Thank you for this talk on AI. Um, we've got quite a few questions for all of you, basically. So, uh, well, I think uh, for in the interest of time, I will try to go through them very quickly. So, uh, the first one, uh, this is about the uh, ML Linux. Uh, whether the cross-line profile shift is constant across different staff and different positions of the fields. Can uh, Matthew give us uh, any comments or answer? Uh, yes, for the field size, we did uh, observe a trend there, as I can. For the field size smaller than uh, around five centimeters, uh, the shift is around uh, 1.1 to 1.2 millimeters. And then for the field size larger than that, usually we observe something like a 1.5 millimeters shift. So there is a slight difference for the field size. And for the different steps, it's uh, really hard to tell because this kind of a 0 0.1 millimeter or 0 0.2 millimeter change it really depends on how you uh, how well your water tank is aligned. So I, I, yeah, uh, from what we have observed, uh, uh, the, uh, the difference is minimal. Right, so I, I suppose uh, uh, that would be the same for different gantry angles as well? Um, certainly, yes, uh, but uh, yeah, but because the Lorentz force uh, depends on how, how the, the, the uh, electrons di direction. Okay. And uh, there's also a question about the potential of MRI only workflow if you're using ML Linux. So what do you think? Um, of course, uh, yeah, there is a great potential of doing this. And I guess, um, but there is still a long, uh, long way to go. And I guess it's becoming more mature, especially in the um, region of pelvis, brain, and Professor Jing Chai has just shown us uh, the example that it, it could be very robust in the head and neck as well. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Professor Jing Chai has any comments on that. Well, thank you, Matthew. I think that's an excellent question. And uh, I think looking forward, I think that's uh, almost certainly it will happen, uh, MR only based RT. Uh, I think that's a goal. And that actually will address many, many of the issues currently we have when you have CT, MRI together, uh, you almost always need to register them. That itself introduce some errors. So I think ideally, um, uh, will be MRI only based planning and treatment delivery and assessment, everything. Yeah. Right. But that really depends on the size, like in the in the abdomen, that could be a really complicated 
think, yeah, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Probably not for every site. Uh, yeah. This is a question about the uh, single isocenter multiple lesion treatment. So, um, so Nelson, what, what's the typical slide thickness you would use for imaging, like uh, one, centimeter, one millimeter, three or five millimeter? Yeah, I, I would um, use a one millimeter to um, avoid the partial volume effect as much as possible. And um, I think three or five millimeters would be too large, especially for um, small lesions that have size comparable to that. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, the errors that you've shown us, are these errors systemic error or random errors? Um, so um, when I do this error analysis, I have combined both the um, random errors and systematic errors to form the um, overall delivery errors um, using simulation with MATLAB. Um, but in SRS treatment, all these random errors would turn into systematic errors because um, we are only giving one fraction to the patient. Okay. Uh, actually, did you, did you just use the absolute value? of these errors or, or are there any directional aspects that making them more like systemic error of your of your system um i have done uh that, that, that's that's two nelson i've correlated all of the x y and z errors and then turn it into absolute errors okay um this is this is a question which well it, it says the um the audience came across the news about using portable MR machines. Uh, uh, do you think, or any of you think that you, the MR machine or portable MR machine will work in the radiotherapy department or has a role in it? Being a portable system. Any um, comments from the- Is, uh, is this question speaker? for me or? Uh, um, any one of you actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think- I okay, so maybe maybe I, I speak up of my thoughts first. Of course, this is a very exciting development, and um, especially if if the if the magnetic field is less than zero point one tesla, then I guess um, we we would be very happy about all those ML safety assessment as well as those ML safety training things. Yeah, but um, uh, again, I think there is really a, a long way to go because um, uh, you you it's really. You, you really have to beat the physics that we, we have a much higher SNR in the high magnetic field. And I, I guess the, 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 the AI development certainly helps a lot. But then by that time, I guess we could also uh, have a lot of um, ML, uh, uh, functional ML monitoring of the tumor as well. So, yeah, I don't know how, how the others think about this. Well, I think that's a fantastic, uh, from the speakers. Uh, fantastic uh, development over there. I think, uh, you know, as Matthew mentioned, it's probably too early to say, but I think uh, we can definitely keep our eyes open and I think uh, things are gonna happen. And uh, I think there's a trend for machines and devices becoming smaller and, and to, uh, I think it's very likely, you know, in the, in the long term. That's, uh, that's a question about AI. So Jane, do you think AI-based image enhancement will introduce any uh, uh, will introduce any artifacts that were unseen in conventional image processing? That's an excellent question. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, uh, it will introduce some sort of artifact, but depends on the application, depends on algorithm. We have to assess that artifact case by case. And <laughs> I think that's where uh, the physicists uh, should be involved. And uh, first of all, you know, there are some conventional ways uh, in terms of image quality assessment, we can certainly do that. But maybe, um, you know, there, there are some hidden uh, features or characteristics of the AI generous images that we cannot see by eye. But I think the, the, um, the idea is, uh, whether the images generated uh, actually satisfy our clinical applications because for different clinical applications like contouring those calculations or assessments they have different kinds of requirements we need to be very specific and, and understanding the limitations of the ai generated images 
are there any particular examples that or, or experience you have come across about this kind of uh, new type of image artifacts? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. I mean, gave you an example of contouring because everybody are familiar with that. Um, if you use a large number of data collected from different hospitals, uh, contoured by different people with different experience, and likely there's a large variation in your data that are used to, for the training, and, and likely your model is not that good because your input data is not in uh, high quality. And for example, you know, I know a very uh, well-known center and there is a um, expert in, in, in one particular cancer type and this physician countered all by himself for uh, you know, over a thousand of uh, data and use that for training. I think in, you know, in that case, it's quite consistent in, in quality and everything. And um, so the model you know, will be different. It will be more likely uh, to be in a higher qual quality model. So. I see. Right. This is this is a question about MRI again. And, uh, about the uh, the MRI linear treatment session, how how much time it takes to, uh, I mean, in general, for overall treatment time, including the uh, the MR imaging setup and correction, etc. For the and MR imaging, yeah. uh, everything yeah, actually, the, the whole, yeah. Uh, first, uh, for the MRI imaging, yeah, there are preset uh, sequences uh, built by the vendor. So it uh, ranges from around two to six minutes for the purely for the MRI imaging. And then for the whole process from uh, the patient setup to uh, the time when the patients could leave the treatment room, uh, the time uh, ranges from around uh, 30 minutes to uh, up to like 1.5 hour. That really depends on whether the oncologist would like to recontour everything. And I guess the uh, benchmark is that if there is no such a uh, recontouring, the time uh, will be around 30 to 45 minutes, uh, even for the SBLT cases. Uh, for if, if, if we do the ATP only approach, um, this is uh, about the same as in uh, other worldwide centers. And then for the ATS approach, where uh, that is we will do the um, recontouring as well as the um, of uh, a full uh, optimization that would take uh, something like from 45 minutes to 1.5 hours. Yeah. That, would it be more like site dependence? I mean, some particular sites are, I mean, are usually more time consuming to treat or some are easier or more like a clinician dependence or patient dependent from the experience? Um, yes, that's off. Uh, of course, that depends on how the uh, variation is and how you are. Um, how well planned about how uh, you going to do the recontouring. If we do the uh, real, uh, daily recontouring, then it's best to uh, assign, say, who, who should be responsible for recontouring those OAL, as well as uh, how how many OALs are we going to recontour? Like, uh, can we if, uh, accept that we contour every other slices and then do the interpolation, something like that. So it's really uh, important to have the practice and there's a learning curve there, of course. Yeah. Right, so it sounds uh, like uh, protocol dependence as well. I mean, it depends how, how you uh, set your protocols. Now, um, this is about uh, the SIMT again. So Nelson, would there be any limitations or would you say any limitations on the lesion dimensions and distances between the lesions in clinical considerations for SIMT for the sink art center body lesion treatment? For um, the target to isocenter distance, I think it really depends on the uncertainty of the SRS system being used. Um, so I would recommend performing end-to-end -end test or um, off-axis Winslux test to quantify these kind of errors. And in our center, we actually haven't imposed any limits on this target to isocenter distance. And our measurement has suggested that um, with target to isocenter distance up to nine centimeters, which is as far as it goes in the brain SRS, um, the accuracy were acceptable and the spatial discrepancy are all below one millimeter. And how for, about the distance? Oh, sorry. For the sorry. target sorry. size, um, uh, I can see where you're coming from because the, those calculations um, would tend to be more inaccurate for really small lesions. And also the geometrical inaccuracy um, could lead to a complete miss of the target if, if you only, because the target is just so small. Um, and but in our center, 
uh, we use a two millimeter margin for this small lesion. So um, we don't actually have really, really small lesions. And the smallest um, we treat is about maybe 0.2 cc. So I think giving a PDB margin to this very small lesion would be um, helpful. It would help reduce the target miss and, and the additional brain that you need to rate it is, not, is also not very large. So I don't really have a number for the smallest dimension you can treat, but um, it would depend on the accuracy of the SRI system used. How about the distance between the, the, the lesions, if they've got more than one lesion? Yeah, that, that also would depend on the accuracy of the system as well, I think. So there's no limits that has been set for, for the moment in your center. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, right, there's a, a question on AI. So Jane, uh, for the uh, for your uh, DL, the deep learning model training, do you think we need a computer cluster with lots of GPUs, or is it a workstation with a GPU sufficient? The question <laughs> certainly more is merrier, but uh, it depends on the task you're doing. Uh, like the examples I showed you. Um, I think it's quite durable. Usually, you know, two or four GPUs will do a decent job. Uh, sorry, I think um, I'm kind of missing you. I think there's some noise in the background. Yes, just just give me a second. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, please carry on, Jane. Yeah, oh, okay, uh, yeah, quickly uh, to, uh, yes. to uh, comment on this uh, again. So uh, usually I think two or four, you know, if you have a little more a GPU, uh, that usually works okay on the, you know, similar tasks that I mentioned in, in this research. Of course, it depends on uh, what kind of research that you do. So, but the, the more the better, anyway. I think that's absolutely true. Um, this is the question to Matthew. So, how many how many patients can you treat in in on your ML net in one day? I mean, assuming there's normal working hours. Um, right now, as I said, we use uh, around uh, thirty to forty five minutes per patient. So, if we have uh, around uh, eight uh, <laughs> hours per day. Sorry, <laughs> Uh, most, we could, oh. uh, most we could like treat around 10 patients uh, at most, I guess. But uh, we, we, there are uh, some uh, institution reporting they have some very effective use of the MRE Mac, so they could treat up to 20 or more than that patients per day. And yeah, th as I said, there is uh, no as well established. Uh, routine about how we utilize the MRE net yet. So I guess um, there's still uh, uh, many, many uh, feasible ways to how we could unleash the power of the MRE net. Okay. Right. Uh, so so how, how, how long do you, do you treat patients on your MRE net every day now in your center? Um, right just, now we are still... Yeah, right now we are still very uh, conservative on how to select the patients that will be uh, beneficial from the uh, MRE net because that would take uh, patients a uh, longer treatment time. So um, actually, we uh, we are still uh, at the at the learning curve. Uh, we are still learning, and right now we have uh, treated uh, around twenty patients. Yeah, in in MRE net. Yeah, we are, it's it's not a it's not a huge number, but we are quite uh, conservative on how we utilize the ML in it. And uh, Nelson, this one is about SIMT. Uh, the SIMT has an advantage of reducing the treatment time, but would actually increase the difficulties in treatment planning and optimization, and also the increase the, uh, the planning time and probably also increase the uh, physics QA time as well. Mm. Um, for planning time, in, with our experience with um, dedicated commercial solutions such as the HyperArc, the um, beam arrangement and uh, collimator optimization or even plan optimization can become automatic. So the treatment planning, the total treatment planning time could be um, quite fast and typically we can do it under an hour. We'll have an optimized plan. 
but um, the physics QA time could actually be quite long, especially if you have um, many, many lesions. And uh, we, we don't usually have the time to do all of the QA for all lesions. And typically we'll do true composite compos measurement for um, one or two lesions and then use uh, Mobius, which is a calculation-based QA system to check the rest. Now, this is, this is the last question of today, and this is about AI, but I think all of you can uh, give your comments. Um, right, right. Um, when AI technology, or when do you think AI technology will be fully integrated into our radiotherapy treatment system and reduce medical physicist working time? I'm not sure it's a good thing I would do. Uh, <laughs> any comments? Okay. Um yeah, this question, as Mike just said, all right, <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, I would say uh, AI already slowly, gradually, sorry for the noise here, getting into the uh, clinical already, uh, for example, uh, auto countering, right, and uh, auto trim planning. So these are things already happening. And certainly, uh, I think in terms of uh, particular tasks, AI will, I mean, that's the purpose, will reduce the time for physicists. Um, but, uh, you know, as we learned from the uh, advances of computer <laughs> in the past years, it's actually never reduced our working time. So uh, that means we have more time for other things. Uh, things going to happen. Uh, we'll, we'll see. See, and it seems like yeah, I, I think I think your example of computers is absolutely right. I mean, we've got new things coming up and uh, more advanced technologies and techniques coming up with that that uh, require more physics time as well. So, um, any other comments from any uh, speakers about this or any other topics? If no, I think I just hand over back to um, to Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael Lee, for uh, conducting this uh, IFORM School webinar. Thanks for arranging one of the best IFORM School webinars, the advanced technologies, and the, all the speakers were excellent. Thanks to Professor Jing Chai, Matthew Chung, and Nelson Fung for your expertise in your field and uh, uh, giving a wonderful talk, especially AI and uh, people is a buzzword now in the medical physics. And uh, the question which somebody asked, will the workload of medical physics will reduce? It will never happen. We will work more and more, more and more work, QAQC, other things, because it is not just uh, 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 use the software or computer and you get the output uh, because you have to be very meticulous in this thing. So thanks once again, uh, Michael Lee and all the speakers for putting in the efforts. And uh, this was a support for the FOM. And I look forward for more such collaborations uh, uh, from uh, Professor Jing and others uh, who is leading a huge team of uh, researchers, I could see uh, his last slides. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, dear participant, this uh, IFORM school webinar is a CPD accredited from ACPM, and every hour two points you will get it. So the link already Chai Hong, the chair of the PRC, she has provided. So please put your information, you will get the CPD accreditation and CPD point certifications. As you know, AFORM is doing a lot of activities and uh, every year we organize AFORM meetings in the form of AOCMP. This year's AOCMP 2022 will be in Taipei, Taiwan from 10 to 12 December. Already the website is functional. The abstract submission is open. I will appeal all and a lot of young medical physicists I could see into this, uh, uh, the, as, as a delegates here, uh, should, will uh, give their presentations, submit their presentations. Also, FM has started a lot of awards. Please do visit to the FM website 
and you will find the uh, awards for the students, for the PhD research, for the PhDs, for the seniors, everyone it is there and they are already on the website and within a month or so we will announce for the applications because all these awards has to be decided and to be awarded in AOCMP 2022. So please keep a watch on the APOM website for the announcement. Further, the next APOM webinar will be on the 6th May. Already the brochure is on the APOM website and you can join on the 6th May one hour APOM webinar from 7 a.m. GMT to 8 a.m. GMT. This will be on brachytherapy. Uh, World Congress, the Triennial One Congress, the being organized in uh, Singapore from uh, the 12th to 17th of June, and it will be into hybrid mode. And today only I saw the announcement from the uh, Singapore that uh, no RT-PCR test will be required if you are traveling to Singapore, you are vaccinated. So you can attend in person or virtually already the uh, registration process is on. So with these things, thanking Michael Lee for moderating, arranging this FOM school webinar, Jing Carl, uh, my, uh, Matthew Chung, and uh, uh, Nelson for giving excellent talk. Thanks to Chai Hong, the PRC chair, for taking all the efforts. Rajini Verma, the, uh, the webmaster, Jin uh, Chians, the ETC chair, and all the participants who have participated in large number, I'm sure you must have got benefited. So I look forward for your participation on 6th May for the FOM webinar. On 14th May, we have a special FOM webinar from AAPM on research, research writing, funding, and again, on May 23rd FOM uh, school webinar. So a lot of activities we are doing. So please do take advantage, visit the FOM website for the details. Thanking you all and have a safe and good fruitful time ahead. Thank you very much. Each one of you directly, indirectly helped for the success of this uh, FOM school webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.